I am so exhausted right now, guys. <laughs> Whoo! So I'm finally back from Metricon 2017. In incredible weekend, of course. Incredibly tiring. Uh, uh, my legs and my hips are sore right now. My blood hurts, but it's it, it's a good pain. It is a pain of accomplishment. It is a pain of it's, it's the kind that tells you that you just had an incredible time. Like this, like I don't regret a bit of the aches that I have right now. So this is my post Metrocon recap, as is tradition. Though I've broken tradition a little bit, and we'll explain it here in a, in a minute. But this is first part where we're going to go over autographs and meeting celebrities and guests, and I'll talk a bit about uh, interviews that we have coming up, and. We'll show off the dealer room hall for all my toy people out there who want to see that. And then the con recap itself, the overall review of how I liked everything, that will be a second video that will be coming up just here in a bit. I'm going to record it as soon as I'm done with this. So, we're going to get started with meeting the guests. Uh, this was a stacked year for guests at MetroCon. They wanted to make sure year 15 was big because we had a big reinvention. We had a returning staple of the early MetroCons. We had Steve freaking Bloom. We had the return of Scott McNeil. And for whatever reason, I'm still not even sure, uh, my name was on the list too. Like, Amelie Belcher wasn't there this year, which was actually upsetting because like I usually hang out with Amelie and, ch and we kind of chit chat before we check in at the hotel. And it was, uh, it's kind of disappointing she wasn't here. Like there's part of me that almost felt like, well, one Metrocon staple has not coming. So let's, here's another Metro staple. I don't know how it works. We'll get to that, we'll get to that later. But right now, uh, what to talk about first. So for starters, like the guests I met were really cool this year. So um, I'll, I'll, we'll go ahead and talk, tell you how the interviews went. Uh, Scott's went great. Uh, it was the last thing on his day, so we got to go a little bit long. And we kind of had to reschedule a little bit. We had a slight snafu, but the nice thing like the nice thing about MetroCon is they kept things so professional that they could handle that, and it still worked, still flowed. It did cost me one event, I'll explain, but... The interview went well. We got to go a little bit long to make up for lost time. I did a bit in this one. So if anyone remembers like the Nolan North bit I did a few years ago where I had like actual photos, like uh, this was kind of similar, except I didn't Photoshop these. These were like legitimately old rolls of Scott's, live action rolls, and hearing a little bit of different stuff from him other than just his voice acting career, which you hear about in every single panel. I want to do something a little bit different and remind him of some of the terrible hair choices he's made over the years, or rather, movies have made for him. So, that was fun. And the funny thing is, he wanted the photos afterwards. Like, you'll see them when I do, when I post the interview. Uh, he really wanted to keep them, which, that kind of, that kind of set me back. That was kind of weird. Um, no, but Scott is awesome as always. I think because... I think because Amelie wasn't there, and I know that's usually his like guest hangout person, um, I think I spent more time with him this year than any, because like, it's my first time backstage, and like, you know, one of his usual people wasn't there, so, you know, you know, backstage opening ceremonies, we just end up talking the whole time while we're uh, waiting for people to file in and for the event to start, and we do the same thing at closing ceremonies. Or they let him goof around with a broadsword backstage. I don't know why. I don't know why. No, but cool guy. Like, I like those moments where I get behind the shtick, behind, like, the routine of the interview stuff. You know, you know, we had, uh, we had breakfast on Monday morning. And, you know, I, you know, we're, you know, I'm talking about my grandmother, who at 100 years of age eats pretty much nothing but bacon and black coffee. So, uh, take that, medical science. You know, and I, you know, I get to hear about uh, his pepper farm and what little uh, hot peppers he's growing. It's like, stuff you don't get. Like, you know, like actual human being stuff. Like, you know, it's cool that, like, if you had told 10-year-old TJ that that guy voicing Deadeye Duck and Bucky O'Hare would be 
sitting down with breakfast with you one day, you'd be like, no, 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 that's not, that doesn't happen. It's not possible. But, so, there's still a part of me that's just like, this is really surreal. But another part was like, he's my friend. Like, this is just fine. It's fine. Uh, but, okay, so seeing Scott again was awesome. Speaking of, whoever has been coming up to him at other conventions and using my name to get in with him, um, strange. It's very weird to hear Scott tell me that he's heard of me at other conventions. That people are now asking him about me, and that's bizarre. That is really bizarre. So that's... That, that was cool to find out. A little weird, but cool to find out. Uh, so, yeah. So, of course, Scott was awesome. And you'll see the autograph signings of him. Uh, I'll go ahead and show you his autographs that we got. So... One of the DVDs I found was a movie he did, which is called Sleeping with Strangers. And this was mm, early 90s, somewhere around that. No, oh, no, that's the wrong trademark name on here. Uh, yeah, the DVD was only available in Europe, so of course I imported it. And I imported it because on the cover, if you can see it, it actually lists and introducing Scott McNeil, which I found hysterical. And he got a laugh out of just seeing it, so that was that was a funny thing. It's not a very good movie, but it he's fun to watch because he's just chewing through scenery. So that was a good that was a good surprise. I got that. And then here's the big one. Here's the really big one. Like I'm not ever going to be able to top this big one. Uh, the toy he signed this year is this little guy, and I'll go ahead and stand up and give you the good shot. This is from Adventures of T-Rex. You remember I reviewed most of this toy line a little bit ago for random review. Uh, this is stupid obscure because you can tell, you see that? It's all in German. It's a toy line that only came out in Germany. So a toy line that only came out in Germany in the mid 90s that was obscure then. It's still super obscure now. And it actually had toys only in Germany. So this took me three years to find. I, from the moment I became aware of it to the moment where I could actually obtain one, three years. I had to talk to a German flea market hunter. And Scott uttered four words to me that a man of Scott McNeil's in, infamy should not say to another person. I'll let you hear what those four words are uh, when the interview goes up. Or no, when the autograph signing goes up, which will be soon. So yeah, that's the rarest and most obscure thing that actually has a toy. This It's all downhill from here. Never gonna get anything more than that. Uh, up next, Steve Bloom, who's incredible to talk to. Steve is an incredibly cool guy. Like, like he's one of those that defies the don't meet your heroes rule, because he's that cool to talk to. Very laid back, very mellow, very appreciative of his fans, and very eager to talk about things. I really liked talking to him. Really liked talking to him. Uh, so, the interview went over really well with him. I'm really happy with that one. You're probably going to see that one first of the interview lineup. Uh, his, probably one of my, like, this is, this is going to be one of my favorite autograph stories for a while. Um, so, uh, I get up to, inter I get up to get the autograph from Steve, and, uh, this year the autograph room was held in the dealer's room again, which... No, please don't ever again. It's rough to hand. It's rough. To, I, I understand why, because you know the big events, the special events had so many things going on that they needed the extra ballroom. I get that. Uh, it makes those autograph noises. It makes the autographs really noisy, and that's really bad for especially for people who came there just to meet or get Steve Bloom to sign something and. Like, you can't hear what he's saying because there's so many people being so loud in the dealer room. Um, I went back and watched my footage of S Scott's signing because I can't, because the others, like, don't permit recording of autographs, which is why you only see Scott's anymore. So I kind of, I, I kind of, uh, I, I kind of thought it was okay. Like, I can hear everything, but I don't know. I still don't like, I, still, I don't like having to go through the entire dealer room and you know, rushing through all these people to get to the autograph lines, which were gigantic this year. So I went to the over. They had a they had an overflow room, which was a separate room where 
just if you don't have time or like if the deal, the other aisles in the goodies room are filled up, they put autograph books there. So Steve, Steve Bloom and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, uh, who are now in a relationship, strangely enough, uh, though, uh, those two were in that overflow room. So I go up and uh, my autograph item for Steve is Star Scream, the first edition Star Scream from Transformers Prime. Um, this was a big focus on the interview because he's so different to Star Scream. You can tell he really liked being this character. Uh, this not cheap. I was almost second guessed getting this because it's super expensive on eBay now, but it's so worth it. So. In a, even in that room, even when you know you have just a hundred people in the room waiting for autographs, it's still really loud. So, you know, I show him Starscream, and I tell, him, okay, well, you know what, you know, who do I make it out to? What's your name? It's like, and I keep it simple. I just say I don't say Tyler. I say TJ, because it's very quick. It's hard. Uh, it's hard syllables, so it's easy to hear in a crowd, right? So. Steve Bloom takes Starscream, pops the silver Sharpie, and proceeds to write DJ on the card, and I have to very quickly stop him. So he backs up and he does what you did in school, where you start scribbling over the line until it actually looks like the letter it was supposed to be. So the D very quickly becomes a really fat T. And the J now becomes fat to kind of match the T. And he, has, he takes a blue sharpie and he starts sharpening down the line. So here, you can see it. Like I've got this like super artistic T, <laughs> super artistic TJ, on that on the autograph now. Uh, <laughs> it was it was fun. It was like it was funny to me. Like it, it gives me the story. But he he, he bought the autograph so. Uh, on the table are spreads of all the different characters, art prints of all these different characters he's done over the years. And he tells me, okay, I kind of botched that one, so uh, if you want one, just take one off the table and I'll, you know, I'll, get, I'll freebie it. Hmm, cool. So, uh, uh, we, so uh, I, I had this array of choices. There were more Star Screams there. Uh, he had print of Tom from Toonami. So that was like that one was super tempting, but what I was thinking of was in the next room over, Danielle was recording a panel for me so I could be in the autograph line. So, you know it, that's rude of me. So Danielle has the autograph of Shishio from Roroni Kenshin, one of her favorite roles of Steve Bloom's, and that's made out to her. She's not generally an autograph hunter, but you know I wanted to get her something for you know, uh, helping me out for the weekend. So, so I went to him. Steve, I was super cool. It's like, you know, he's offering a freebie and I'm thinking of somebody else at the time. So again, like that's the guy he is. Steve's super cool. So, uh, I hop over to the next table over and it's Mary Elizabeth and I don't have anything for her to sign. And I felt bad because I had a, I had a special dice set that I wanted to give her and I forgot it at home. So, uh, uh, but before I left for the con, uh, my friend Brent, uh, both me and him are both huge Critical Role fans, and Mary is all about Critical Role. She she's a big D and D geek herself. She loves being on that show. So uh, Brent was telling me, dude, if you get to meet Mary Elizabeth McGlynn that weekend, I'm going to hate you. So I don't have anything for her to sign. So I get up there and I tell her, well, uh, me and my friend Brent are both huge fans of Critical Role. And he's like super jealous that I get to meet you this weekend. So I don't have anything to autograph, but um, I'd, I'd like to pay, I'd like to get a photo with you if that's all right. So, you know, you know they have the list of prices for everything so 10 bucks gets me a photo with Mary Elizabeth who I think about 10 minutes after I left that room I tweeted to Brent so I'm kind of being a real jerk about it but it's super funny it'll be funny to him later that I did this 
this is my favorite story to tell over the weekend. I was telling I was telling uh, James, who's the director of Star Party, this. I mean, he dies laughing. Uh, but it was funny. It was funny to us. But uh, no, uh, I I don't know. I don't know what if it, if it was, but if it was because you know I forgot the dice or that I'm doing this to my buddy Brent as a joke. But you know, as we're talking, she. Uh, grabs two of the Zara prints that she has on her table, her role, her character from Critical Role, and signs one out to Brent. And then, you know, like, uh, so she's, uh, you know, tell me she's, uh, she gifted me the two drawings, which was super cool. Again, these are super cool people. And she, she asked me, like, okay, well, so what's your name? TJ. And then she goes, DJ? Like, no! No! You did not just make the same spelling error your boyfriend made. That's almost adorable, but maybe I need to enunciate better. I don't know. So she, I almost had two DJ autographs in a row, but I don't know that that made it funny. It made it hilarious to me. So I actually have a really good story of that autograph signing. Two very cool people. I keep forgetting how cool Mary Elizabeth is, and like every year she's. Like the third, like the third pick, you know, the third, like the the runner, like the like the backup. Like if I don't get an interview request, like she's like the backup, and I think next time she comes, uh, next time she comes, I definitely want to get to sit down and talk to her because she seems incredible. Which reminds me, if Nick or if anyone, I know Nick watches my post Metro recaps. If anyone from MetroCon and who has a say in who gets invited, I want Mary back. Which I guess that means I want Steve Blo Steve Bloom back too. Who doesn't? But I want Laura and Travis back because I so regret not talking Critical Role with them when I had the chance. So that autograph sign was super cool. Um, the other the other autograph I got was I get well. I guess I should just go ahead and show like that's the art print. Zara blasting a dragon. Super cool. I have to go back and watch the episode now. That that's taken from. So. The last autograph I got that year was Vic Mignogna. And Vic used to come to MetroCon like every single year. He was like the staple guest before Scott became the staple guest. And he was he's like super nice the whole weekend. Like almost like like I don't want to I don't I don't want to like read into it too much or anything, but like almost like used car dealer nice to the point where it's like are you like really this person or not like I can't tell so uh but no super nice with the people he's talking to super nice with me so um uh, his was not so eventful as Mary and Steve but he's a Dragon Ball voice actor he's the voice of Broly so he joined the box and he's super religious and I wasn't allowed to film so I didn't do the sign my balls joke that everybody does with these things but like I have like a a reel that I can make of all the times I did this. So he joined the box. Every time someone from Dragon Ball comes to MetroCon, they sign the box. And appropriately enough, Vic, Broly scribbled across Kakarot, which I think is about the most appropriate thing he could have done. I was actually kind of hoping that's the spot he took. Before I was looking over, like, what's still here that isn't, like, gonna draw over somebody's face. Though Sean Schemmel drew, drew, drew over Goku's face, but I guess he has that right. It's his face. No, so, I think I think that's a grand total of ten autographs on this box now. I've got about just about every major character now. Piccolo. Like, I've got a Piccolo. I've got a uh, Vegeta. I've got two Goku. I've got two different Gokus. I've got the announcer. I've got Trunks. Uh, uh, Trunks and Goten and uh, Adult Gohan. I need Teen Gohan on here at some point. So, one more for the Dragon Box. So, uh, Vic's interview went well, too. Uh, not as well as I wish, because here's the problem. When I when I write my interview cards at 3 in the morning, I put the wrong name of his characters, so it's like uh, there's a huge flub in the interview, but it's funny, so I'm leaving it in. It's a little bit cringy to me, but you'll laugh. That's what counts. So uh, that's probably the third one you'll see uh, as soon as I get all these uh, edited and sorted out. Um, 
but yeah, he was he was cool to talk to. We got we got some cool stuff out of him. Um, yeah, but that was that was pretty much what the uh, the long and short of my interaction with the celebrities were. Uh, there were others there that I wasn't as familiar with because I stay in my own little like personal YouTube bubble. Um, uh, Max uh, uh, Middleman, who was uh, One Punch Man. Uh, he has an improv group with uh, Robbie Damon and Ray Chase. All three of them were there. I didn't get a whole lot of time with them. Uh, uh, Caleb and Jonathan were both uh, YouTube singers, cover artists. Uh, not really familiar with their work, but super cool guys. I was talking to them a bit uh, before opening ceremonies too. Kind of sitting under the learning tree of, inter of uh, YouTube and I recorded their panel too, which was super informative, like really informative stuff for, you know, young or up and coming YouTubers. And for the first time in Metricon history, I raised my hand and asked a question at a panel because this is in my wheelhouse and I want to learn, you know, but it's cool that even with their level of popularity, like that much higher than mine, it's just like, there's absolutely nothing to ego like all three of us have the same opinion of just we're just doofuses like we're like we're we got audience because we're lucky more than anything uh but it's super cool to know that they're like that and they you know it's not in their head in any way just because their numbers are really large uh so that was really cool and this is also the first year i got to talk to uh, some of the others like uh, pika belichu who's the cop uh, a cosplay guest has been to like the majority of metro cons and uh, never really got to talk to her, never really got to do much, but, you know, like, we are you know, opening closing ceremonies, just kind of standing around talking to people, waiting for uh, your name to get called up to go on stage. So, yeah, so it's nice to finally meet her. Uh, but that's about the end of what I can talk about celebrity interaction-wise. So I'm going to go ahead, let's go ahead and talk some toys that I got, because the dealer's room this year was huge, though I will admit, something about the dealer's room this year didn't, feel right to me like it's not, partially is because I'm so out of touch with modern anime there's a lot of stuff up there that's like super popular right now that I just haven't watched you know there's a bunch of One Punch Man and uh, Attack on Titan of course uh, which I still haven't watched either the, either of those properly a uh, bunch of Yuri on Ice you know which isn't in my wheelhouse to begin with I just I don't know there's a lot of stuff where I felt out of place and you know there's like a you know like Funko Pops everywhere, of course. Knock off Pokemon plushies. Where's like, you know what? I've got my Scyther and I've got my Sand Slash, and that's all I need. I got my Patamon. Like, I was this close. Of like, maybe I should get Gatomon as well to go with Patamon. And they're like, no, no. Uh, I have nowhere for plushies. I don't even have places for those three plushies. So I'm going. I'm I'm good there. I'm I'm good. So, uh, the dealer's room for me was a little bit lost. Um, it was a little bit weirdly laid out this year. Like, typically I know, like, roundabouts where they put certain types of tables, and this year is all kind of topsy-turvy. Like, uh, uh, Anime Fix is a, is one that I try to visit every year, because, you know, I, I know the, I know the woman who runs it. Um, there's another booth. There's another booth that gets a lot of import stuff. You know, it's one of the only booths every year that has something common Rider. So I try to check that that as well. He knows me. Uh, so yeah, I like trying to hit up friends and people I see every year. And like it was like one of them I didn't even find until like I'm leaving the dealer room on the last day. Like it was just I couldn't find anybody. But I had goals in the dealer's room this year. I had a few that I met and a few that I missed. So like the goals I missed, I was looking for a new wallet because mine is in tatters. I didn't really find any that I thought looked good or thought could hold up, so I don't have a new wallet. And I was looking for the uh, I was looking for the Mega Man X Nendoroid, and there were tons of Nendoroids there. No Mega Man X. I found normal Mega Man, not uh, not the X version. So that was that was a little bit disappointing, but not not terribly much. You know, it's just. It's Mega Man X. I will take whatever I can get. And like, I was thinking, like, well, the Mega Man one's been in stock forever, so of course I'll be able to get Mega Man X. You can't get Mega Man X now. You just can't. So, the stuff that I did manage to get, I was trying to hit a little bit of all my little loves right now. So, 
uh, mission one was replace some of the Monster Hunter uh, Rebel text that I sold off recently. So we have this little tiny Rathalos where it's really hard to see because I'm so far away and everything on my camera looks dark right now. So yeah, very cool. I wanted one where the pose didn't have like a big stand getting in the way. So he's rubbing his butt on a rock. He just is, don't, a don't ask me why. But yeah, really cool Rathalos sculpt. Wings out and splayed, really cool. And a Jade Baroth. Uh, Baroth I really like. And the original is, has a little bit of sentimental value because it's one of the monsters me and Justin, uh, Drew Wario, went to hunt. Uh, we, were trying to, we, were trying to help, uh, we were trying to help build up two of his chat room regulars. So we, you know, we, went off, we went off hunting Baroth so they could get new armor and new weapons. Uh, but yeah, I like the color of the Jade version. I, I really like the monster design. I meant to get more of these, but I was looking for like a Lagiacris or Lagiacris, however you want to pronounce it. I've heard it both ways. Um, that one I didn't get to see. Uh, they had like a, other variations. I wanted the original. Uh, Zenogre, they only had one and it had like a le lightning off its back, so I, it didn't really uh, appeal to me. But yeah, I meant to get a lot more of those. So now we'll get the three. So I guess that's just, I don't know. I might, I might grab a few on eBay. Uh, we did pick Mega Man up a little bit. So we have the four inch Nell Mega Man that I originally skipped. I got this because in the dealer's room it was like the actual price of the toy. Like it is like, this is like the retail price, dude. So, okay, okay, I'll take it. You know, like, you know, I, I actually went so light in the dealer room, I probably would have gotten like the super expensive, like, you know, like Super Mega Man from Mega Man 7 that they made with like Cut Man built in, with, in the box with them. But no, but uh, this is again where I'm missing Mega Man X. <laughs> like, I just I just paid for uh, Volnut. I already have EXE and now I have this one. So now I need to dig up the Mega Man X. So once I have two Mega Man Xs I need to go dig up now that are getting hard to find. Um, continuing on. My little passions. Actually, I found the Inkling Girl from Splatoon. I took the price tag off this one as soon as I bought it because I was ashamed of what I had to pay to get this because she's super rare thanks to super demand for Splatoon right now. But yeah, I wanted an articulated figure, and until Figma picks this thing up, then this is about the only option I got. So I have a Inkling Girl. That was neat. That was nice. It was nice to even find like rare little Nintendo figures like that. Uh, see, next up, we got the dice set that I bought. See, it's, it's Chessex, it's like glitter, ruby, and gold numbering. It's really pretty to look at. Super cool dice set. Uh, I do want to do the sugar test. This like, this like, I warned you guys against Chessex dice, so we'll see if these are balanced or not. They're kind of translucent, so I don't think they, I, I think they should be balanced. But, uh, Obligatory plug, they came from Oblivion Games, the premier TCG experience located in Tampa, Florida. And I do that because, and why do I plug them? Was the dice set free? Not at all. The owner's a fan. So, uh, good talking with you. We talked some common Rider. We kind of had the same opinions of like Ghost and Forze and the current ones like X8 and Guy and we loved and like Ghost was like, eh, it kind of fell apart. So, this is kind of cool. It was, it was really cool. Like, I love chances to talk Common Rider with new people. So, that was cool. It's like, oh my god, a dealer's a fan. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, well, here's the big ones. Uh, the DX Twilight Princess Link from Figma. With a bajillion weapons for display option. This is one of the toys I had to cancel in order to afford Metrocon in the first place. Like, I, I, can't, I chopped off probably a good dozen pre-orders to make sure I could afford everything this year and the other room went light they had this so da -na -na -na. I need to get Zelda now I guess I, yeah I need the pair but I really like Twilight Princess so it was nice to get this and again it's close to retail which was surprised me I found one toy in the dealer room this year that was actually cheaper than the one I found at the toy store later on I don't know how that happens but it happens and then uh, back to the anime fix booth which I should, I should say, like, the Monster Hunter figures and the Mega Man came from another booth friend of mine, uh, from the Good Guys, Bad Guys booth. 
It's laid out tons of Dragon Ball Z figurines. It had a bunch of Gamera and Ultraman, too, this year, too. Uh, but from Anime Fix, we have the Garuru Saber. I saw this on their Facebook page when they got it in stock, and I'm like, please bring that to Metrocon. I will so buy that if you bring it to Metrocon. And I will be honest, this is... I paid way over the original price for this. I paid... Well, I, well, not maybe not over the original price, but I paid more than what I could pay to get it now. Because the demand on these is pretty low. But I know how expensive the booths are there. I really like the people who run anim, Anime Fix, so I'm happy to help you pay for your booth, and I will, I will, I will splurge. But that's really all I grabbed in the dealer room this year. Like I had to go, re I ended up going really light, not because I was trying to watch my budget, because there just wasn't anything catching my eye. Like, and that happens. It happened last year. Like sometimes I'm just like my 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 mine, and this year is just like, eh, nah, nah. It happens. But uh, my trans, I didn't find any transformers there. That's what stunned me. Like I, I ha like another booth friend I have is you know runs a, you know like runs like vintage toys there all the time like old Power Ranger morphers and Care Bears and uh, a big you know like th three big storage things and display boxes of vintage Transformers and I always bring home a G1 Transformer and that's like been almost a tradition for like four years now and he wasn't there this year and it, that really upset me like I almost want to email the guy and go dude are you okay like. Uh, could you, like, tell me you just couldn't afford the booth fee this year, or, like, it just wasn't worth carting everything in, or, uh, like, tell me, like, you're not laid up in the hospital or something. Like, like, like he wasn't there, so I'm, like, w worried about him. So, uh, no Transformers from the dealer room this year. I only found three real ones. Uh, one was, like, a Super x Braun from Japan. Or, I guess that's Super Wild Ride, I should say. Which is a toy I've already owned and then sold, or else I would have gotten it, because the price is really good on it. And then there were two Beast Wars figures, Japanese Beast Wars. And I pick one up, and I go, well, how much is this one? He goes, $45, because that's like a really rare and special import. And I go, it's Apache from Beast Wars 2. It's identical to Baboom that was released for a third of that price in the U.S. It is not special. You can't get over the dealer room upsell shtick on TJ Omega. I know what it's worth. Baboom would have come home with me. If Baboom was 10 bucks cheaper, he probably would have come home with me. But no, it was like, no, you're, you're trying to upsell me on something that really isn't that special. So, tisk tisk, No buy. So... I actually did a really good job holding myself back in the dealer room this year. Like, I actually managed to hold really well into my budget and and control myself. Like, I was really proud that I came home with, like, like I still had half the cash I, I pulled out just for dealer room spending. And I was kind of happy that I managed to, like, resist that all that weekend. And then Danielle had an appointment on the way home, so I got left at Toys R Us for a little while. Mistakes were made. I'm gonna go ahead and show it just because technically I bought it with my con money, so technically it is uh, a con purchase, even though I didn't buy it at the con, but just to get out of the, just to get out of the way. <laughs> I adopted a T-Rex! Mmm. That'll keep me busy for a while, and no, I don't know when I'm going to review it because it's gigantic and it's hard to keep in camera. And they had, and the leader Megatron, as well, because they had like a buy one get one 40% off that expired the day before, but no one took the tag down, so they had to honor it. So, okay, so I did a little bit of Transformers purchase. It was weird because Toys R Us had a bunch of stuff I was more interested in than the dealer room. I thought I felt bad about that in a weird way. So that's the celebrity stories. Those are the autographs. That is what I got in the dealer room. But we have to move on to the proper review of the overall con. And I'm going to take a little bit to uh, rest my throat, uh, sort my thoughts, and just kind of go over the weekend itself. Because of all the stuff you saw, the most important piece of plastic I brought back from the convention this year 
was that. So I'll tell you guys all about it in the next part.